Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the third annual leadership symposium hosted by the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis of the Clemmer College of Education at ETSU. Uh, my name is Dan Yuzhang, a doctor fellow of the ELPA department. This morning, I will come up the stage for quite a few times. I hope you won't be bored. <laughs> uh, if you were present at our first and second symposiums, you will notice this morning that our uh, current symposium will be presented in a different format. Instead of having the audience go from one room to another for different presentations, we intend to present you with a comfortable environment by having you in one conference hall, listening to and interacting with different presenters. On your table, you can find what we have prepared for you, a notebook, a complimentary book, and the other symposium materials. To guarantee a nice environment, we would also like you to set your cell phone to vibrate. Thank you very much. Now let's welcome Dr. Scott, Chair of the ELPO Department, to deliver her speech of introduction. Thank you, Daniel. Um, my part is very short and it basically consists of welcoming you and we appreciate all of you being here live and in person and through our streaming mechanism. Uh, on behalf of the uh, department, the fellows and the staff, we'd like to say a, a special appreciation for those of you who have supported this for three years in a row. We hope you'll enjoy today's different format and Daniel will be the one to guide you through uh, the different parts of what we're trying to accomplish today. We would particularly like, and I know many of you who were here earlier this morning, got to enjoy the ETSU Bluegrass Band, and we want to particularly thank them for attending today. They also have um, an information booth set up in the corner, so during breaks, if you'd like to check those out, we would uh, invite you to do that. We also want you to take advantage of an information table from the, the paleontology department, and thank you fellas for being here today, uh, and continuing studies. Of course, our department has some materials for you also, so be sure to check those out there in the back of the room. As an added feature today, we're inviting you to text uh, with some comments throughout the day. And if you will, note on the screen, we have the numbers for you. Note that it's the bottom number that you text to, and it's the first and the first line in your text is the top number. Uh, some of our fellows can help you if I'm not if I'm confusing you with those directions, but we'd like to have this to be an interactive meeting today. Besides those of us in the room today who represent business, education, and nonprofit. We are also live streaming, as I mentioned before, and we would particularly like to recognize our friends and colleagues from Johnson County Schools, and particularly thank Mr. Morris Woodring, the superintendent there, and Dr. Michelle Simcox, a recent ELPA grad, for facilitating this for us. We are most appreciative, and um, as we say, you get to be the guinea pigs, and we hope to expand this next year, and we really thank you for the partnership. We also would like to thank Dr. David Curry and Zion Madden for assisting us with the streaming here from ETSU. Thank you both very, very much. As Daniel mentioned, this is our third symposium. Our first one, uh, the title of it, the theme, was Leading Through the Process of Change. The second was Dealing with Motivation. Today's symposium focuses on forward thinking, and we've built on the previous two symposiums that we've had, the information there, and our fellows have actually been working a full year to bring this event together. So we hope you enjoy it. We hope all of us go away from here somewhat inspired to be forward thinkers and how it might apply to us as individuals and as organizational strategic managers. This morning, we also are very fortunate to have with us as our opening speaker, uh, Dr. Brian Nolan, who is president of our university. And Dr. Nolan, we certainly appreciate you being here as we know your schedule is extremely tight and uh, we appreciate that. And I'm not going to say anything else and let Dr. Nolan have the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and good morning. Um, I don't know if I'm altogether the right person to, to talk around the topic of forward thinking. 
uh, because 20 minutes ago I was headed with great speed to the cult uh, because I thought that that's where this meeting uh, was going to occur. <laughs> I walked through the door and realized, wait, I'm in the wrong place. So we had to turn around and head with speed back in this direction. But I thank you all for the opportunity to talk a little bit this morning um, about some of the issues that are facing higher education in our country, uh, and also a little bit about uh, my journey back home to Tennessee. I want to just open, though, with some of the challenges that, that we face in American higher education, and I think in education in general. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, a couple weeks ago to, to give a lecture down at the University of Georgia. And during that conversation with students, one of the students asked the question, are we at a similar point in time in post-secondary education to where secondary education was with nation at risk? As you'll recall, the Nation at Risk report really put a clarion call uh, towards secondary education to transform the manner in which uh, instruction was provided, assessed, which outcomes were directed, and in which states and systems structured themselves towards the goal of student learning and really enhancing learning opportunities for the nation. But as you move forward to the present, and you ask the question, were we successful? Were all the reforms that we put in place from the 1980s to the present, what happened? Um, if you think from the 1980s to the present, the changes that have occurred in post-secondary education. In 1986, about 70 cents on the dollar of what it took to run ETSU was provided through the state. In 1986, we did not have the level of doctoral programs that we have at this institution or across the state. In 1986, there were no lottery scholarships. There was no Hope Scholarship in Georgia. In 1986, there was no technology that we take for granted today. Um, the ability to text was, was unheard of. Um, in, in many of the residence halls, you walked down the hall, you dropped your quarters in the phone, you talked to your parents until that ran out, or you had something called a calling card. So in 1986, the technologies that we take for granted did not exist. Now fast forward to 2012. Examine the technologies, examine the investments, but then come back to the numbers. And the numbers that I shared with students at the University of Georgia and that I'll share with you today are in many respects sobering. Tomorrow night will be the clash of the titans. Kingsport and Johnson City will do armed battle on the playing field. Time will stand still. But if you were to go back four years to when many of the young men who will compete and many of the young women who will perform were freshmen, and let's say 100 freshmen at Science Hill, of those 100 freshmen, how many will graduate from college in a timely manner? That number's 19. Now that's not Science Hill data, that's data from the state of Tennessee. I'm just using Science Hill as an example. But if you were to take all of the high schools in the state of Tennessee and take a snapshot of folks who are in the ninth grade when they started school in August, of those 100 ninth graders, only 19 will walk across the stage and receive a college degree. So how forward thinking were we? Now let's talk about where we are in post-secondary education. Um, because I, from my perspective, we are at a position in time where it's, it's almost impossible to fathom what 2020 may look like. There's a, a website, many of you have had the chance to review it, it's called Epic 2020. Um, Epic 2020 uh, is probably about four or five months old now, but when I watched it for the first time, I, I just shook my head. I watched it for the second time and thought, boy, I wish it was 10 o'clock at night because I sure need something to drink. <laughs> and then I watched it for the third time and thought, all right, how do we find our role in this marketplace? But if you watch Epic 2020, it tells the story of credits no longer having value, of general education courses such as the course I enjoy most in the world, Intro to Political Science, American Government, being taught to two million people on the web. It tells the story of massive, open, online content and how that will transform learning in our country. 
It tells the story of individuals offering their courses to the world at no charge. And at the conclusion of that, there being an assessment, the learning outcomes tied to rubrics within the instructional medium, and all of that being gauged towards performance on a series of assessments, providing you with a badge. Those badge, badges are then lumped together to create credentials. Those credentials take the place of credits, and the business model of higher education as we know it goes away. Because as we all know, graduate education is supported in many respects by what occurs in large undergraduate sections. They then put into play on this the role of Apple and iTunes and how individuals will go to iTunes and select their courses based upon those courses that had the greatest number of likes and how iTunes and Google would compete to see who would dominate the badge market. And as I started watching this, I was like, well, that, that's science fiction. But if you would have told me in 1986 that I could watch a sporting event or a concert or a TV show on my phone, I would have said there's no way that that's possible in my lifetime. So now take that epic 2020 video and fast forward to three weeks ago. Colorado State University, a public institution, has agreed to take transfer credit from a mock. So as we look forward, what I challenge you to do as you look forward, not only in your careers, as you look forward at higher education, but as you look forward in your scholarship, to get a sense of how much of this is technology, how much of this is substance, and how do we find, how do we define the role of ETSU within that marketplace? Because there clearly is a role for institutions such as ours, just as there's a role for Morgan State and Walter State. Many have said, well, this is going to put folks out of business. But I, I don't believe that position because I go back to my 100 ninth graders, 19 graduate from college, and now let take, let's take that forward to a broader economic landscape. I, I'm going to tell the story of where I, I've lived for the past six years. A state that is, is tops at the list of, of all the things you don't want to be tops at the list of. Uh, number one in the country for women who dip. Um, <laughs> protein. <laughs> number one in the country for obesity. Number one in the country for childhood obesity. Number one in the country for, um, for drug use among pregnant women. Number one in the, in the country for, number one in all the things you don't want to be number one at. And number 45 or number 50 for all the things you'd like to be number one at. And as I was looking at long-term economic forecasts for that state, uh, there was a study that was conducted by economists in Morgantown that was then validated by the work of Anthony Carnevale at Georgetown University. Dr. Carnevale's work put forward projections on the number of college graduates that are required to sustain economies, both nationally and at the state level. And in Dr. Carnevale's work, he projected that that state needed to produce an additional 30,000 college graduates by 2018 just to sustain the quality of life that they already had. So I gave that speech at a, at a rotary and I had data and all these fancy maps and this person in the back raised her hand and said, well, Dr. Owen, what you're telling us is we have to double our number of college graduates every year between now and 2018 for us to sink as bad as we sink now? And I said, yes. Our number is well in excess of 120,000 additional college graduates by 2018 in the great state of Tennessee. So we need as many people as possible going to college. We need as many people as possible graduating from college because those individuals who are exiting the workforce are exiting the workforce in mass. And the folks who are coming behind, the generation of individuals aged 25 to 38, for the first time in our nation's history, our older population, those folks who are retiring, are better educated than the younger population. That's staggering. You all have heard that statistic before, but it's staggering. Look at all the reforms, look at all the investments, look at Pell, look at, look at the Hope Scholarship, look at technology. The younger population is less well educated than the population of individuals who's getting ready to exit the workforce. Only here and in Germany does that exist. So for me, as I try to look forward, all of these access points, 
massive open online course content, ETSU, Walter State, um, and the good actors in the for-profit sector all have a role in helping us to develop that human capital potential. That, to me, is an exciting research agenda. Just examining questions related to learning content, um, how, you, how you objectively assess student learning within specific areas. What, what is the value of a badge? How does a badge fit into an approximation of credit hours? Is it possible for us at ETSU to take courses and sequences? Is it possible for us at ETSU to do it as they have done at a community college in Arizona, Rio Saluda Community College, where they start a new semester every Monday? So if a student were to take an online course, we met with Dr. Karen King and her staff this week, and they have students who can complete some of our online courses in three weeks. So rather than making a student wait until January to take the next course in the sequence, what if they had the opportunity to begin that next course the following Monday, because a new semester starts every Monday? Those are research questions as much as they are policy questions. And as scholars, as faculty, as students, as students who are merging in your scholarship, I would encourage you to, to take a look at some of this. We're very fortunate in Tennessee that we probably have the most robust set of databases of any state in the country. From the value-added data systems in K-12, which thankfully this year, because of legislative change, we will be able to examine what happens to our graduates as they move into the workforce. Um, we are also able to examine what happens to our graduates at ETSU as they move into the workforce as a whole. So there's a, a website, um, Ed Measures, that has, and this is somewhat troubling, there's a lot of George Orwell in here, but you can assess political scientists from ETSU and how many of them are living and working in Tennessee against political scientists from other institutions in the state. Those are data points that students and parents are paying attention to, but those are data points that are ripe with research opportunities. So a, a quick comment on uh, my journey here, because uh, some of the graduate students had asked me to talk a little bit about my personal leadership journey. As with most individuals, much of your path in life is a function of hard work, good fortune, and someone opening a door for you. Uh, I began my graduate career, I began my undergraduate career hoping to be a pharmacist. Um, my father convinced me that I needed to live in a small town. He spent an hour and a half going to work every day to drive 15 miles and he would come home every night just furious. He was road rage before it was defined. <laughs> the dad said, son, live in a small town and never work for the government. Well, I listened to him on one of the two. Um, but I, I started in, in, in pharmacy, really struggled with some of the concepts in organic chemistry because I was not finding relevance. But I found relevance in American government. Um, it attracted me. It was something for which I found passion. Completed a master's degree um, and went on to graduate studies. I went to graduate school to be a, a, a faculty member with an expertise in the American presidency. I had an undergraduate faculty member, uh, Robert Clerico, who really inspired a passion in me for the presidency. I defended a dissertation proposal on the presidential use of executive orders. And as I was working through that process, I had a chance to have a life-changing conversation with my major professor, a gentleman who was doing his research on seatbelt legislation, traffic safety, and helmet laws. And at this time, the General Assembly in Nashville literally had a debate occurring on whether or not we should mandate seatbelts and mandate helmets. And I said to this faculty member, well, why don't we go to Nashville? You have this rich database. I've spent all semester helping you do statistical analysis. You had a number of conference papers on this, two journal articles. You're one of the foremost experts in the country on this policy area. We need to go to Nashville and help inform the debate. And the response was, well, Brian, I really don't want to do that because it would bias my research and I would no longer be objective. And that was a soul-searching moment for me because I began to question, why am I doing this if I'm unable to utilize the things that I'm doing to help improve society in a direct way? So you can kind of see my research bent. 
That next semester I had a chance to be a graduate student uh, and work in the office of the provost. The provost at the time was John Peters, who's now the president of Northern Illinois. And in working for Dr. Peters, I had the chance to do faculty salary equity studies. I had the chance to put together information on student teacher evaluations. But I had a chance to roll up my sleeves, get my hands dirty, and take what I was applying in the classroom and put it to use, at least in my simple way, to better something. And I said, I think I like this higher education stuff better than political science. My wife and I were about to get married, and as all folks who are about to get married, you need a job. I was now working in institutional research, and there was an ad on the web. Um, and the web was in its early points at that time. You still, in many respects, bought ads for placement entities on the web. And the ad was to go to work at this place called the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. I'd never heard of it, but I knew it was in Nashville, and I knew I needed to get to Nashville. So my wife went to Vanderbilt, uh, she toured the institution, I toured with her, and we then, she was driving and she drove me downtown to this building and she said, put on a tie, it's in the back seat, put on your sport coat, it's in the back seat, go up and tell them you're interested in learning about the job. I said, I can't do that, I'm just a graduate student. She goes, put on your tie, put on your sport coat, go up there and tell them you're interested in the job. So in her Saturn, behind the offices of the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, which, by the way, is right in front of the jail. Um, so if you see someone putting on a coat and tie in a car in front of the jail, you think they're going in for a hearing. I then went upstairs, knocked on the door, and met someone named Bill McCulley. Talked to Bill and said, Bill, I'm interested in this position. Uh, what do I need to do to apply? Then went through the application process and he gave me the job. Not only did he give me the job, he gave me the job above the job I was applying for. And when I had my first day at work, a few weeks later, I said, you know, Dr. Cully, I'm still curious as to why me. You know, I had no experience. I'm just a graduate student. Um, why me? And he said, because you knocked on the door. And if you had the wherewithal to knock on the door, then that showed me that you had something to come to work. So my point being, as you're looking at sending out your resumes, that personal phone call, that personal touch separates you. From there, I had the great fortune to work with Rich Rota, the Executive Director of the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, who gave me plenty of opportunities to fall blade my nose, um, and plenty of opportunities to pick myself up and blade my nose again. Uh, I had a, a life-changing experience at THEC. Um, I had an experience that caused my dissertation chair to want to shoot me. I changed my dissertation topic. I defended an entirely new proposal. And I did all that while I was teaching two courses in adjunct um, and working 60 hours a week. So I'm now getting into the point of I'm knocking up against the door in which I'm going to have to retake courses because I'm about to quote unquote in a non-technical phrase, time out. And Dr. Rota came to me and said, Brian, I'm gonna give you three weeks. Don't come to work. Go write. Write as much as you possibly can. And if you have not submitted your dissertation, by the end of the summer, you need to find a new job. So that was both motivation and compassion, because you find me someone who gives you three weeks off to pay and go right, you found a great place to work. That's my last point before coming to ETSU. This is as much about fit as it is anything else. Your journey is as much about finding the place that's home as it is anything else. I had the chance to find a home in Tennessee. I had the chance to find a home in West Virginia. Um, West Virginia was foolish enough to hire me as their chancellor at 36 years of age. I remember going in for a meeting with then Governor Joe Manchin. It was eight o'clock in the morning. He wanted to meet with me before he agreed to hire me to, to lead the state's higher education system. We walked into the office. My son was 18 months old. We drove through the night. He didn't sleep and I didn't sleep. I walked in, Donna walked in, I'd never sat in a governor's office with just a governor before. About 30 seconds in, he looked up at me and goes, boy, how old are you? <laughs> but once again, knock on the door, walk in the door, if you have a little bit of passion, it's the right fit, it'll work. Um, so the journey to ETSU, in many respects, 
was a journey to come home. At one of my going away events, um, and most of those just turned into roasts and opportunities to, to, to kind of poke fun, um, someone stood up and said, Brian, I'm, I, very few people get to call their shots. But if you remember, uh, your second year in the job, we were standing on the well in the legislature and I asked you, what did you want to do next? And I said, well, I really would love to, to go to East Tennessee State University and work for the institution. I had no idea at that time what anything would happen, but I knew that this is where I wanted to be. Because in fact, I was almost here once. I had gone through the process to have an ACE fellowship, and I was going to spend that ACE fellowship with Dr. Stanton. But as that was coming through the process, West Virginia called and said, we'd like you to come to meet the system. The point being, there's nothing that's determined. I didn't go to college thinking I was going to be here. I went to college thinking I was going to count pills. But sometimes life throws you twists and fates. But if you find the right fit and you are assertive, then things sometimes come together. So the leadership journey, there's nothing special to it. In many respects, it's not altogether anything to write home about. Um, but for me, the leadership journey is a function of individuals who care, and individuals who decided to give people who were very junior in their career an opportunity to, to, to fall down and to make some mistakes. So with that, we're an institution that is going to fall down and make mistakes. As we move into this world of massive open online course content, we may try some things and fail. We may, as we go through the 125 process, try a lot of things and fail. But you learn from your failures, and that failure will make us a better institution. Fortunately, we've had, from my perspective, the most outstanding senior leadership team in the state, from our deans on down the line. We've not had a lot of failures at this institution, and I hope that we can continue that as we move forward. I'm well past my time, uh, so I'm gonna get out of the way. I thank you all for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I know I'm gonna hopefully have the opportunity to, to do a little um, work within the department in terms of guest lectures, which I assure you I'll link to the literature I like what I did today. Um, but if you are looking at the literature and you're interested in policy, Read the work of Don Heller. Read the work of Mike McClendon. Read the work, if you're interested in diversity policy, of Sylvia Hurtado. Um, read the, the early work of King Alexander and Chris Brown. Chris Brown's now president of Alcorn State. King Alexander's now president of Cal State Long Beach. Look to the work of Eric Ness, who's doing a lot on applied policy as it relates to lottery scholarships. If you're like me, you like things that are applied, there is a niche for you in the scholarship and there is a niche for you in research, particularly in higher ed. Because unlike political science, within higher education, as a faculty, we are willing to roll up our sleeves, get our hands dirty, and do research that benefits society. Thank you all very much. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you. Have a great day.